G'day everyone, I'm the man called Kimo Sabi, the man with a plan from the land down under, and I was recently reminded of the shit scene in Mr. Miracle 11 where Darkseid is depicted over nine painful panels, eating from a vegetable platter. I'll admit I never read this issue, I bought the first few books off the miniseries based off of your boy's recommendation, but I never got the enthusiasm to actually read past issue one. I went and read this issue online before I made this video, so I'm not talking out my ass. The feedback to this particular scene was almost overwhelmingly effusive. Modern comic fans, or is that fans of modern comics, just couldn't get enough of this idea. They talked about it nigh endlessly, to the point you'd be forgiven for thinking Tom King, the author of this shit show, hired Argentine and bot farmers to spread the good word. Do a quick Twitter search for Dark Side Veggie, two simple terms, and see the non-stop slavering over this asinine abomination. When I first saw the scene that angered me, not because a character was eating a veggie platter, a term that now seems as grating to me as the eternal chalky milk pronoun professors love to me. My chalky milk! Don't you touch my chalky milk! It's my chalky milk! But I couldn't say exactly why. Why did this scene bother me so? Was it the pointless addition to what has been slammed as a terrible run by a people whose opinion I trust? A run considered groundbreaking by people I loathe? Was it the further contribution to mundanity and another step towards the bottom of the barrel by modern comics? Sure, it's all of these things, but it had to be something more. I've seen garbage scenes in comics before. Bad dialogue, bad stories, bad characters and bad concepts. Not just in modern comics. Every era has its clunkers, its low points. There was something more concentrated about this awful page that, I suspected, spoke to the sad state of affairs in modern comics and modern comic fans. If you did that search for Dark Side Vigi, you would have been inundated with mind-numbing slavish adoration for Tom King and Mitch Gerards, who has me blocked for some reason. People unironically lauding it as the best thing they've read this year, or even the best scene they've read in a comic. And of course it's not. No one would ever pass a polygraph saying this was the best scene they've ever read in a comic, unless this was the only scene they'd read in a comic, which also makes it the worst scene they've read in a comic. The funny thing is, it's the worst scene in this comic. Tom King needs an editor, he'd cry himself into a coma if he had to work under an old school editor, a Jim Shooter or a Tom DeFalco. So why do they say it? Why say it's good when it's not? And why do it so publicly and so slavishly? These people are tripping over themselves to suck King and Gerard's literary and artistic dicks respectively over this mundane scene. Lots of the tweets, and this could be the problem, this sentiment was common on Twitter, and Twitter is the home to a great many mental illnesses, profess this scene to be vastly humorous, overwhelmingly funny. And they got me thinking about the nature of comedy, what modern fans find entertaining, and how that mindset is damaging character stories and IPs, bending these long-standing characters to the point where they break, the point where maybe they can't be repaired anymore. There is a contrast at work here, the idea that Darkseid, the most dangerous and feared villain in the DC Universe, more than a villain, a god, a vast, terrible, unknowable, invincible god of death and conquest, calmly eating vegetables and dip, and doing so in such a human way. As some soy-swilling waste of oxygen points out, Darkseid double dips. Apparently there's nothing more gangster than that. Absurdist humour is nothing new, Monty Python popularised it, elements of it were mainstays in The Simpsons and later Family Guy, when these shows were better than they are now. One of my favourite Simpsons scenes here demonstrates what I mean by absurdist humour, a kind of impossible serendipity that's played straight, and the massive leaps of believability needed for it to happen is what makes the gag work. Mo, I need your advice. Yeah? See, I got this friend named Joey Jojo Jr. Shabadoo. That's the worst name I ever heard. <laughs> Joey Jojo! It works on a bunch of levels all at once. Homer clumsily assembling this ridiculous name, expecting Mo to believe it, and then Mo does, citing it as the worst name he's ever heard. The cherry on top though is a random background character running, crying from the bar, his friend calling after him, Joey Jojo. In all the bars in all the world, right there, right then, after Homer came up with his impossible ridiculous name, somebody with that same name was behind him listening. It's absurd. It's impossible, but it's played like it's not, and the unbelievable levels of serendipity needed for this to occur is what elicits laughter. I believe that Smooth Brains and the descendants of the Joss Whedon speak generation don't really get this kind of humour. They see it as that's so random, kind of humour where random outbursts of Spork or To Penguin of Doom is considered funny. It's not, but they think it is. They don't really understand humour, so they slot in sudden random noises, sounds and events in its place. When the tick cried Spoon, or claimed while undercover in full costume that his name was Nick Soapdish, there was context. It wasn't funny because it was random, it was funny because it was absurd. With the That's So Random crowd, there is little to no context. There's just juxtaposition of A to B. Quiet to loud, slow to fast, calm to crazy, an immortal god of death eating a vegetable platter. With a single page, Tom King has undone a lot of what Darkseid is and has done. For a whole generation of comic readers, this has redefined the character. When you search Darkseid on Twitter, about half the results are about the vegetable platter. King might have been aiming for those towering levels of serendipity needed to believe Darkseid would do something so mundane and human, but he failed. 
And in doing so, he forgot something very important, something that modern fans and modern writers so often forget, or if they know, they neglect altogether. As a writer of these long-standing characters, these characters that have been around longer than your grandparents have been alive, you are a placeholder, a law keeper. You are a caretaker, someone whose job it is to care for these characters, maintain them, like a garden, until it's time to hand them off to someone else. If you do your job well, the characters will grow a little, they'll become better, more colourful and deeper, more complex and more useful to tell stories with. If you do your job wrong, these characters will wither and shrink. You'll damage them. They'll be less nice to look at, and worst case scenario, they die off altogether. There's a long-running joke in the Marvel Universe about Captain America having bad breath. I don't know who started it, but I'll blame Bendis. It seems like the twee sort of thing he does. Lots of characters, especially teen characters, would comment that Cap has bad breath and doesn't know it. Never mind that Cap's immune system is so well developed it'd be impossible for the bacteria that cause bad breath to develop within him. It devalues and reduces the character. It makes him less. It takes the shine off his legend. A legend decades in the making. Nearly a century now. And it's intentional. These writers want to devalue and deconstruct everything. The same goes for Darkseid on this page. Whenever I see Darkseid do something terrible and vast and powerful, whenever he omega blasts an enemy into oblivion or orders the destruction of a planet or the genocide of a whole people, that vegetable platter will swim to the surface like a literary turd bobbing in the toilet bowl. These writers exist, and to a large part have been raised in, a postmodern world via a postmodern education system that extols postmodern virtues, such as they are. Jason Black has spoken at length about how the main thrust of postmodernism is that nothing is concrete, nothing matters. Everything is up for interpretation. The goal of this way of looking at media is to take ownership away from the artist or the creator. If you make a work that others claim is homophobic or implicitly racist or sexist and you deny it, that counts for nothing anymore. Never mind that you made the work and you know exactly what it is, what it means and what its purpose and limits are, postmodernism says your interpretation matters less to the viewer than their own. Furthermore, their interpretation of your work is more true because you have implicit biases that you don't even know about. The purpose is to remove ownership of the property from the creator and shift it, ostensibly, to the so-called fans. But I think it actually goes a little deeper than that. Is it any surprise then that postmodern writers seek to undo, deconstruct and devalue these long-standing creations? Everything they've ever been taught tells them that their interpretation of, say, Superman matters more than Siegel and Schuster, more than Dan Jurgens, Jerry Ordway, Roger Stern, George Perez, Grant Morrison or John Byrne. More than you, more than me. And this kind of mindset leads to writers who think their interpretation of your favourite character matters more, even if you've been reading the character's adventures longer than they have. In an industry with more snowflakes than a Canadian winner, you've got writers who care nothing for what came before and less than nothing for what might come after. They are petulant children playing with your favourite toys, and they are destroying them in such a way that not only can you not enjoy them, and not only will others not be able to enjoy them in the future, but they are actively undoing the good things, the good memories and past adventures by devaluing the now. They are bending the characters to breaking point, and when they break, these toys won't ever be the same again. They can never be as good, never as function as well as they once did. These toys don't belong to you, not anymore. I believe they did at one point, for a few years, when the story served the readers. The writers were the caretakers looking after beautiful gardens of evocative narratives, nurturing characters like rare and colourful plants. They knew that their paycheck depended on that sense of ownership, that investment by the reader. Modern writers are postmodern writers, and they think the character is a toy they get to play with, a vehicle for their own ends and agendas. And if you're lucky, they'll let you pay for the privilege to watch, complain and get blocked or dogpiled online. We live in a world of very clear black and white. Not morally, that's grey as hell, but the black and white of acceptable thought versus wrong think. The danger-haired human eggs and soy-mouthed comrades that praise this scene come from a long line of right thinkers. 2 plus 2 is 5. They are NPCs, they get their pre-approved programming and parrot it until the next update goes live. Trump bad becomes BLM, becomes COVID, becomes the Ukraine. They even laugh in unison at pre-approved gags, mistaking contrast for comedy. In a postmodern world where everything truly funny is easily and inevitably interpreted as problematic, is it any surprise they all dogpile on this one scene? This one safe, lol so random scene that does as much damage to the character as Kirby did good in creating and defining him. The king himself would be spinning in his grave right now, seeing his legacy reduced to something less meaningful than a Ren and Stimpy visual gag. This is what modern writers think is worth your money. This is what modern audiences are happy to pay for, or at least what they've been told to be happy to pay for. They wouldn't want to be seen as wrong-thinking Nazi istophobes by expressing dissatisfaction with twee food gags of the lowest order, so they seal bark and clap on cue. When writers get accolades for zero effort, when the comic news media lords them as the next big thing because it's problematic not to, why the hell would they try any harder? Furthermore, 
Can they even grow like this, or are they stuck in a cycle of sycophantic mediocrity? For anything to change, you need to be a wrong thinker, a questioner, calling out BS writing that damages the characters you love. Gatekeeping is not a four-letter word. There was a time a creator on a book that was universally loathed by the fans would be moved on. The NPC influx brought on by the MCU doesn't allow for dissent. So fight back the only way you really can, with your wallet, with your hard-earned dollars. Or be condemned to an industry full of page-long veggie tray gags.